In this video, I am at JHW Classics, a fabulous private collection of some very, very interesting cars. But I'm not here to drive those. Oh no, something a bit more hubnut. No, I'm here to drive these incredible, tiny Japanese cars. Both of them meet K car regulations and uh, both contain some very interesting engineering. We've got a Honda N600 here with a tiny little automatic gearbox and we've got a Suzuki LJ50 which has a three cylinder two stroke engine. Now the subject of our first video here is going to be the Honda because uh, I've always been fascinated by these little cars in some way Japan's answer to the Mini and then the second video we shall take a look at the Suzuki. So let's start with the Honda. So it doesn't take a genius to realize that Honda was quite seriously inspired by the Mini when it came up with the N series. Uh, they clearly took one look at one and thought hmm there's some ideas we like and some we don't. One thing they did like was a transverse engine with the gearbox in the sump and that's what this uses but as we'll soon see the engine is very very different and the, the looks overall there's definitely a bit of a mini vibe going on. Uh, the N360 was the smallest version that was launched in 1967 which was only one year after Honda started selling cars in the UK uh, starting with the, the uh, little S800 sports car and then moving on to these little N series models. We got the N600 which had a slightly larger engine 600cc um, but it's worth looking at the power outputs of these engines. The 360cc version which was the maximum allowed by K car regulations in Japan at the time produced a little bit over 30 brake horsepower so it was an insane amount of power for such a tiny little engine. These 600s produce more like uh, around 40 brake horsepower, um, so they're not quite so highly stressed, but um, still they've got a lot of punch. And uh, car magazines at the time found they had equivalent performance to a one liter mini from a 600 cc engine, yet cost about the same to buy as an 850 mini. And it uh, could be more economical as well. So. Um, very very interesting. Uh, this example has an automatic gearbox, the Honda-matic, which we'll explore as we go driving down the road. Uh, Honda one of the first to ally um, an automatic gearbox to such a small engine. Uh, Honda approached Borg Warner and said this, these are our requirements, we need a gearbox that can handle a tiny engine revving to 8,000 pounds and suffers very few losses. And Borg Warner said uh, bye so Honda were forced to develop their own torque converter uh, and their own very, very clever gearbox, the Honda-matic. Uh, it uses dog clutches like a motorcycle box because that's what Honda knew um, with the little torque converter. So um, it's quite, it should be quite snappy through the gears. Never driven one, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Uh, and it's also a transmission that has very little in the way of losses because it just isn't like a regular automatic gearbox. So look forward to putting it through its paces, but let's have a bit of a more detailed look around. So this charming little front end, it seems they almost forgot the requirement for indicators and side light units. They're rather perched on the end. It's an air-cooled engine and it sits right behind this grill, which we'll take a look in a moment. Delicious, dainty little hubcaps. We may have to remove those. They have a habit of flying off. But uh, yeah, the proportions are very mini-esque perhaps just a touch longer and uh, it looks like it's rear engine because you've got these ventilation ducts here but that's just for the interior to allow air to come out. You've got the rear lights uh, perched on the corner there's a certain mini quality to those they're just a bit higher up exposed hinges on the boot lid just like a mini and these dainty little reflector reverse light units um, there's some really really tidy details on here. These side windows do open so there's a bit of ventilation in the back but not how you'd normally expect. Uh, they actually pop out from the bottom so you get air coming in directly into the rear. That's quite a neat little feature but I think we'd better have a look at that incredible engine. So here is the uh, remarkably clever little engine. Overhead camshaft and two cylinders next to each other going up at the same time. 
uh, there's a gap between the cylinders and there, there's a chain and it's a chain that comes up from the crankshaft to drive the overhead camshaft. So it'll rev quite happily to 8,000 revs and produces around 40 brake horsepower uh, through this cane little carburetor here. And then the, the gearbox is in the sump, it's all sort of effectively one unit and it weighs next to nothing. The engine itself under 100 kilos. Yeah, the full speed manual gearbox would be underneath. This has got the Honda Matic, uh, which is a little bit different itself. But look how neat it is in this engine bay. Look at the way the jack is um, and the handle are squeezed in here. You've got the um, spare tire over the other side. It's a masterpiece of packaging and inspired by the Mini, but so very, very different to it. So this engine is an absolute screamer. It can also deliver very good fuel economy. Here's another delicious touch. How do you make your fuel flap secure? Well, you have it so you have to open the door and pull a little peg to release it, and then you can put fuel in. That's a delightful and such a simple way of doing it, but still lovely in its terms of its engineering. And if we move around to the back, I should grab the key, which I'll have a look at the dainty little boot. Incidentally, there is just one key. Uh, that's most unlike a lot of cars at the time. Uh, pop the boot open, and uh, it's very dark in there, but surprisingly deep. There's a big box of something in here, and a drinks bottle. Um, so it's a useful amount of space, but you've got to kind of come down here kneel down to get into it. So perhaps the Mini wins there with its fold down boot lid, which um, gives better access. If we move inside, uh, lovely door furniture, lovely mechanism there. The window winder has a lovely engineered feel to it. We've got these little seats that tip to allow access to the rear. Oh, punk! There goes the horn. So that's quite nice. Let's see what it's actually like to sit behind the wheel. Oh, cosy is how it is, unsurprisingly. Uh, so you'll note we've got a column gear lever. So taking some inspiration from America there, but um, it, it means that there's no space taken up by a gear lever down here. The manual did have a gear lever that sprouted out from underneath the dashboard. Uh, there's our gear pattern. So one, two, three, drive, neutral, reverse and park. So you can manually select the gears. Uh, there's a modern stereo and a switch that goes from defrost to um, your feet. Uh, very simple, concise dials. Hello, you can see me now. Uh, very clear, very concise, easy to read. Uh, we've got one column stalk for the indicator horn here, as we've discovered. So there's this dainty little stalk here, complete with a headlamp flasher. I think. Uh, wipers controlled here uh, with a, I think it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a push. You have to build up your own pressure for the screen wash. Sadly, I know the, there is a split in the pipe, so that might not work. Lights you pull out and, uh, oh, it tells you we've got main beam on there. So it's, uh, that's quite nice if I put the ignition on. There's the charge light as well and the indicator. So. There we are with the charge light on. If we put the lights on, we get the main beam. Just clear, simple, concise, really nicely laid out. With the, um, we've got a readout there for the um, gears. Um, the seat is a bit, this is a bit compact for me. I might have to see if I can move the seat back a little. Yeah, with the seat set for me, I can't actually even get my feet in here at the back and my knees would be well into the seat in front. Um, I, I think we'll have to say the rear is, um, children only and not full-size western adults but uh, it's a bit of a shame because i would quite like to sit here with my little opening window i quite like that i'll notice the um, cute interior light uh, so it, it's not feeling as spacious as a mini because i can actually sit in the back of one of those albeit i wouldn't want to spend too much time there right here we go then i've just gone to check the gear lever and it's not even there See, it sounds like a single cylinder engine because uh, they're both going at the same time, I think. Uh, it's got an interesting rasp to it, but we'll drop it into drive. And we shall go off. Oh, 
yes. The steering wheel isn't quite even. It's closer to me here than it is here. It's on a wonk, a bit like um, a Jaguar-y type of all things. Whew. I think I'm going to like this. I'm going to do the window up though, because it is quite cold. Yeah, those are very smooth gear changes. I think it's a three-speed gearbox, but I think it has got torque converter lockup because Honda realized they really needed the gearbox to be as efficient as possible. Now, I consider a torque converter lockup as something that only comes along much later in the development of the um, automatic gearbox, but here was Honda doing it in the 1960s. Steering's a little vague, we're getting blown around quite a lot today as well. And by 50 miles an hour we're starting to get a little buzzy. But I don't think this engine will mind. It's not the most peaceful engine, but I'm not sure it's that bad really. Give the brakes a shove. All drum. Yep, I feel good enough. I'm moving something down there, I'm not sure what it is. I can't do a wiper test really. Well I can, let's just do it anyway. There we go. Yay! Nice dinky little wipers. Good overlap. No triangle of doom there. Oh, we've lost the engine. Uh, Jane did say the idle seems to be a bit low at the moment. Uh, so, come on. Make some interesting noises. I do like that a lot. Yeah, you, you wouldn't call it peaceful. It, it sounds quite moped-like, doesn't it, really? Although mopeds don't change gear, to be fair, because they have, tend to have CVTs, but uh, it's got that sort of vibe. It reminds me of driving older tuk-tuks, uh, what scooters sound like. Uh, but, you know, all the controls, what few there are, fall very nicely to hand. And the visibility is excellent. And it doesn't feel like a slow car. I mean, it's easy to say when you're driving in a 30 limit. But, uh, yeah, it just feels very jolly indeed. I am absolutely delighted to finally get to drive one of these. There are ventilation flaps I can open down here if I feel I'm getting a bit warm. Uh, so that's quite funky, extra ventilation, because, you know, Japan can be quite a hot country. I don't know if the gearbox kicks down, I guess we'll find out in a minute. We're coming to the end of the 30 limit. It's, it's certainly smooth for pottering around town, but uh, let's go and see what it's like out on the open road. So if I plunk my little foot down... No, it doesn't really kick down, but I can drop it into second. There we go. We're back up to 50. And we're doing 60 miles an hour. Bit of wind noise you can hear going on. It's downside of quarter lights really, but I suspect the wipers and other items are catching a bit of air as we're driving along. It feels um sprightly enough you're always aware it's a two-cylinder engine so it's not as smooth as a mini engine but uh yeah i don't think it's too bad for that i can smell a slight whiff of engine fumes that's something you do get with these air-cooled engines but let's see if you keep up with the modern traffic this ford uh cougar i think it is in front of me can't really even tell could be a kia I don't think I've ever had such a big smile on my face. I am loving this. Oh, it's on defrost. I'm going to set the heat to room. We also push this lever in for extra heat. I think it's already in at the moment. But yeah, in an automatic, that really is where you want the, the lever. So I can see why they thought that would be a good idea. That was my fault. I'd left it inferred. I 
back in drive. Trying to decide which of my feet I use for braking. I'm quite a fan of left foot braking, to be honest. Oh, there we go. Woohoo! <laughs> oh, this is such a jolly little car. I think that engine is actually um, fairly smooth and it pulls quite well. So, um, you know, we're pottering along here and it's not sounding rough at all. Because it will rev like crazy because uh, it's a Honda. That's what they did. And interestingly, with this Hondamatic transmission, they actually fitted it to motorbikes for a time as well. Uh, you still had to select the gears yourself. They thought a full automatic on the motorbike might be a bit much. But they did actually sell Hondamatic motorbikes. And the Hondamatic system continued as well. It was also featured on the Honda Civic, which replaced the N series really uh, in 1973. And that was a proper car, really. It was still proper Honda, don't get me wrong, but a huge success in America, where its um, CVCC engine met the European emissions without any bolt on rubbish. It was um, just able to burn fuel efficiently enough from the factory. Very, very clever. Very, very Honda. Oh, there's the kick down. Yeah, very smooth gear changes. Yeah, effect effectively dog clutches, it's like a constant mesh gearbox. The gears are always meshed, but clutch packs uh, dictate which ones are transmitting drive at any particular time. Uh, it's so Honda to just think outside the box and come up with a completely different way of doing an automatic gearbox rather than bands and the way the uh, a conventional gearbox would work. A conventional gearbox would have too many losses for these tiny engines to cope with. Whereas I bet this isn't much slower than the manual. All the ride is getting a bit bouncy at times. We've got simple leaf springs at the back. We've got McPherson struts at the front. And these cars were a phenomenal success. They sold over a million. And to put that into context, Honda only started building cars in 1962. And back then it was churning out a few thousand a year. Yeah, 60 miles an hour is um, no problem. That engine's turning over quite quickly, but it's, it's not unseemly the amount of noise. It's mostly wind noise you can hear. So it was this car that really turned Honda's fortunes around. Uh, although the Civic took it to the next level, really. It just went up a, a note further. And Honda went from a manufacturer of motorcycles and odd little cars to a proper car manufacturer. But there's, there's a real design ethos that came from Mr. Honda himself, Soichiro Honda. And that pervaded right through until, I'd say, the early 1990s. So everything from a Honda NSX to an Accord Aero Deck, a Civic, uh, they all have a certain feel, a certain Honda feel. And I'm, I'm getting that here as well. Honda didn't make cars like other people. They did have clever ideas. and rethought how things could be done they made no assumptions that that was the only way to do something and uh, i think that's why they appeal to me i mean i'm no engineer far from it i use hammers far too much for that but i admire the engineering in these cars yeah the ride's a little bouncy it doesn't handle like a mini but then to be honest few cars do minis are utterly remarkable i will say the seats are um they're not the most supportive. Um, so, to be fair, that was probably not too dissimilar to other cars on the market at the time, especially in this class. Uh, this would have been a five or six hundred pound car when it was new. Yeah, this doesn't feel a struggle at all. I mean, in terms of power, it's given quite a bit away in CC. Uh, competition would have been Reliant Rebel. I think that had a 700 CC engine. Uh, the uh, Mini would have been 850 or one liter and the power is, it's in that one liter ballpark. 
Hillman Imp 875cc. The Citroen 2CV had a 600cc engine. It made only 29 brake horsepower. So uh, Honda was getting superb power out of these tiny little engines. And we'll find somewhere to try and do a proper acceleration test. Right, let's do an acceleration test with manual gears. There's 50. That's getting quite loud now. Oh, 60. <laughs> oh. That little engine just spins and spins and spins. I have a feeling the 600 produces maximum power at about 6,000 RPM. Whereas the uh, the 360 would rev easily to 8,000 and beyond. Which is just unheard of at the time. I'm pretty sure a Mini produces maximum power at about 4,700 revs. So stark, stark contrast to the British engineering. But the Japanese were forced to think that way. Uh, some other fascinating um, early Japanese cars. The Daihatsu Fellow Max that I drove in New Zealand. And uh, the Suzuki I'll be driving next. I'm really looking forward to that. So while it might appear at first that this little Honda is just another Japanese clone of a European design, uh, it's proof that it's not that at all. Sure, Honda looked at the Mini, but they thought, we can do better, we can do different. And uh, they really did. It hasn't got that precision handling of a Mini, but uh, it's, a, it's got some very novel engineering all of its own. And uh, I think you'd be very, very happy with one of these. Over say, you know, you could get an automatic Mini with that rather, um, agricultural four-speed AP gearbox also having to work on the engine oil. I think this does a much better job. <laughs> oh well. Well, so clever. Really is an engineering marvel. Another thing to consider, Honda had the um, S500, 600 and 800 sports cars remarkable engineering pieces but share almost nothing with these cars and the m360 400 and 600 completely different engine just two cylinders whereas those little um, honda sports cars have four tiny cylinders and four tiny carburettors to go with them uh yeah so there's no carryover <laughs> at all to these models maybe there's a switch or a stalk that's shared but that's about it so this really was a, a clean sheet for honda's second car design and uh, that willingness to reinvent would stand honda well in future and of course honda would go on to work with rover to learn more about the european market and uh, that relation eventually came to an end and while well, Rover might well have wanted to carry on if it hadn't been for being bought out by BMW I'm not sure Honda agreed I think Honda felt they had learned what they needed to learn so very very clever company but uh, definitely used some European manufacturers to help them get exactly what they wanted but pottering around town especially this gearbox is just a delight in fact I can change gear without moving my hand from the steering wheel just a little column stalk away and it's so quick to respond as well this is um very well thought out car well i hope you've enjoyed uh, that drive of the honda n600 what remarkable engineering such a different solution and so very very honda i must declare i have a huge love for honda and uh, that has only helped cement my love of these vehicles so uh, thank you very much to JHW Classics for letting me drive this car. You can check them out on Facebook and at jhwclassics.com on the website. Uh, Jane always has little reports about what the cars are doing, uh, which is um, 
lovely to see, it's a good page to follow and you will see these cars at shows and things as well, so that's always good test on this vehicle to come but otherwise, I shall say thank you for watching and I shall see you in another video, farewell oh.